And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Miltra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. One half hey, of... Uh one half of Shrike Tabletop and cr and co-creator of Arrow of Silence, the one and only Robin B. How are you doing today? Hey, yeah, I'm Robin, she, her. Um, I'm doing great. Uh, nice to finally get to sit down and talk with you. Mm -hmm. So, it's a bit of a tradition around here. Well, aside from the drinking. For, and for the record, Irish coffee because it's because my af because afternoon is morning for me. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. So, with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick for you? Uh, I that's okay. So I've been playing for like twelve years. I'm twenty four now. Uh, started actually playing with. Uh, my co-creator of Shrike, Dan. Uh, we were both the same age. Uh, Dan had gotten the fourth edition D and D starter set. This terrible, awful game that I loved to death. You're in good. Uh, You're and... in good company. I've defended. I've I've been defending fourth edition since 2008. Yeah, well, yeah, we were we were children, so like we weren't even like aware of like the controversy. We we both just stumbled on this like book, and I got to. I had always been drawn to stories as a child, and I finally had gotten to, like, tell these stories with friends, which is really all I had ever wanted to do. Um, and also, I had, with my first time playing, got to play two characters and have those characters fight each other, and that level of freedom just fascinated me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just kind of became a thing. I played off and on until I was 16, when I, like, when I was 16, I got really into it. Uh, not so much playing with Dan anymore, but like, you know, just, I, I, I had a local game store that was like five minutes walking distance from my house. I was the luckiest fucking kid in uh, swearing fire on this podcast. We, we use the seven dirty words as one of, as one of our holy mantras. So you're perfectly fine. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. Uh, I, so I was like, I was, I was the luckiest fucking kid in like town and like, I, I, I got to like go to the store all the time. Um, I played Warhammer. Realized I was really bad at Warhammer. I'm so sorry for the sirens. No, um, no worries. I'm I'm probably gonna have to deal with um probably gonna have to deal with tornado si tornado sirens in about a week. Oh yeah, yeah. Be safe. Um, and so yeah, I, I, I kind of drew. I fell off of Warhammer, and uh, very quickly. Not to like get too much into like identity stuff, but like a lot of queer kids end up playing D&D &D, uh, because they find a way of, like, escaping their minds and, like, escaping, like, their current situations and, like, exploring other ways to be. Um, and that was definitely one of those cases where, like, I didn't really understand it in myself at the time, but that was what I was drawn to. Then I quickly started game mastering. And when I was game mastering, <laughs> my second game was 13 players. <laughs> Jesus, Christ. Jesus, fucking Christ! <laughs> Thirteen. At that point, at, at that point, you just start having people roll d twenties, and you don't really care about the the rules as much. We split that group up really quickly. I would hope so. <laughs> yeah, I was seventeen and terrified. Um. Jeez. So yeah, I like I grew up in this game store, and eventually, mm -hmm. uh. I, yeah, I've since I've been 16. There hasn't been a time where I haven't been in like a at least once a month game, mm -hmm. uh, and I prefer it that way. It is very good for my mental health. Yeah, and just overall, like I, it's my favorite way of storytelling, like my favorite form of storytelling. When you when you mentioned doing a couple, when you mentioned having a couple characters in your uh, fourth edition days, that's um were able to fight each other. I hope one of them wasn't a star packed warlock because well you have my sympathies if you tried to make that work. It was it was entirely just um the, the starter set. I did not spend a lot of time with fourth edition because once I stopped playing with Dan, I wasn't no one no other gamer would want to play that game. 
at the time because mm. it was it was it was taboo. Which, like, I reflect on is a very good. It was a very good time to have started playing RPGs, in my opinion, because I don't feel as shackled to D and D as a lot of people today do. Oh, oh, that is. So that's that a manifesto is. that we've written. <laughs> isn't that? <laughs> we, isn't that? An, there, there's the under. Oh, the sole, the sole, re, the sole reason that people are so shackled to D and D is the reason why I started my channel to begin with. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's good to see people pushing back and, like, you know, not, like, there's a place for D&D, of course, it's the classic, but, like, I I want to play something else. Well, I remember, I remember, I remember, roll, I remember having a massive, um, eye roll when I, I, now, he, now, I delve, I delve into a lot of, I delve into a lot of different medias to give me inspiration or give me dumb, good ideas or dumb ideas, usually both, um, but I remember rolling my eyes once when when uh, some when somebody asked me how how they could adapt um, Berserk into into D and D. And there's so many other systems. I, and I, or um, I think one. Uh, and I'm I'm sitting here thinking, why would you why would you use an ostensibly high fantasy game for something that is definitely not high fantasy? Yeah. Have, or um I remember so some, nice I um I remember some I remember, I think one of the I think one of the dumber ones was when was when I saw somebody trying to figure out how they could adapt JoJo into D and D and I'm like I'm giving you a five minute head start before I beat before I slap the shit out of you <laughs> for <laughs> for insulting me like that. Because, yeah. Oh we have Drake has a weird connection to JoJo, but that might be another tangent. Yeah. Um, well, let's well let's dive into that. So first, how did Shrike come about? Was because a lot a lot of times when people, in my experience, when people end up making their own games, it starts out as a hack of another system that just goes out of control. Was that the case with Sh with Arrow of Silence? So Arrow. Of there's kind of two origin stories because Era of Silence is two projects merging together. Um, kind of a Reese's peanut butter chocolate situation. Um, mm -hmm. Those old ads. Uh, yeah. But, um, um, so, what I was doing with Era of Silence for a long time was Era of Silence was like the writing world I had always been working with just in my own time as a fiction writer. Mm -hmm. And, it also had a lot of like clear uses as an RPG uh, as an RPG setting. So yes, in in that sense, Era of Silence is um, a hack of something because it actually started off as I had like a Savage Worlds uh, rip that like I a setting guide I made out of Savage Worlds uh, into my own into into the Era of Silence like flavor and feeling. Uh, that was when the story was much more of like a steampunk sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's aged up into like more of a biopunk, futuristic, apocalyptic kind of, sort of deal. Um, but so that was one half of the project was like this era of silence, like setting for an RPG that I wanted to use. And then Dan had this idea for a non-linear difficulty system. I, I'm trying to figure out how, basically like you know how like. D and D is like linear in the sense that you're always rolling a d twenty and adding a number, and the person with the best number always rolls. Yeah, and you pray, and you make sure to pray to the dice gods that they show mercy, which they won't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, that goes into like the math of the system, but like, um, so we found a way around that. We're the only game that we know that uses that kind of math. But um, so Dan. Like all good ideas, um, we were sitting at in in, uh, in Dan's apartment late at night, uh, uh, all relatively inebriated. Well, okay, I'm relatively inebriated. Dan's sober. Dan is far too sober for how much he's rambling about this like math system he's made. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and like finally it clicks. And it's like, oh, this is actually the greatest idea for an RPG I've ever seen. Um, not to be arrogant, but like it's it's a really good idea for like a math system. And I'm very proud of it. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I'm very proud of Dan for what he did with it. And so that's kind of where we, we, we kind of combined these two halves and began forming rules around those core mechanics in the setting, and that became Era of Silence. Yep. Um, since you mentioned that it's that there was a bit of Savage Worlds DNA, that did touch into one thing I was going to ask, which was, um, did did some did some of it start from a lot of play with um set with Savage Worlds? Because the thing is, the names kind of are similar, and the idea that attributes are defined by die types are similar, but mm -hmm. that's about where it breaks off. Because we use a dice pool system. Yeah. Um, and we also, and this is the big kicker, is we're a roll low system. Uh, which really fucks with some people, but I swear it's not just to, for attention. It, it makes it work. Um, the the math know, would not work otherwise. I'd have, I'd have to wonder if the, if the whole idea of aim low would, would fuck with people less if they, if they hadn't been, um, if they hadn't been conditioned to to think yeah, that you it, always have to go high because when you look just, at the when you look like at the bigger Western picture gaming. when you look at the yeah. bigger um when you look at the when you look at the bigger tapestry um mm -hmm. roll low, roll low is not as uncommon as a lot of people think i mean runequest has been yeah. runequest has been doing that kind of thing set, since 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 the uh, late set, since the late 70s um i'm a relatively big fan of uh, dark heresy uh, the second mm -hmm. edition of Dark Heresy, I thought was a very good investigation game, and that's a that's a roll low system. Yeah, war, um, war the the majority of the Warhammer and for, and forty k games, um, third edition um, Warhammer, not notwithstanding, are are um, roll low. Um, there's been um, I've talked I've talked with the guy behind Aliens and Asteroids and his Inversion Twenty setup, and that's and that's roll low. It's you usually see it with usually see it with percentile. You don't you don't often see it with with die pool, but it's not um, it's not out, yeah. it's not as out of reach as a lot of people think. I th I think it's I think it's more of pe of people being used to the concept of adding up. And to that end, would it be fair of me to assume that instead of, that more often than not, instead of um, instead of doing some sort of static modifier, you're you're more likely to add more die to the pool. Yes. So the idea is um, your attributes or qualities are uh, a simple line of four stats that determine your die type. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the type of die you're rolling for a skill check. And then the amount of training you have in the skill is how many dice you're rolling. And by creating this roll low scenario... Um, and like a variable target number, there are situations where the die type matters more than the amount of dice, yeah. and vice versa, depending on the target number. And that's where we have everyone engaged more, which is our goal with the system, is a lot more player engagement than the kind of very island structure that D20 encourages. Mm -hmm. Now, something that... Some, I will note that there were two games that I was, that I was reminded of... Um, when it when it comes to this approach, even though both of them are roll high, it there are there are some um, thematic similarities. Um, one of them, which which um, arguably might be a bit weebish on my part, is Tenra, uh, Tenra Bancho Zero, and yeah. the and the I other one, um, Tenra was is a, a Jap is a Japanese tabletop that got translated a few years ago. Um, it is probably the most Japanese game out I will ever play. I'd be interested to read it though. Um, I, I'm the systems expert of Shrike. I'm, I, yeah. I, and by that I mean I hoard, I hoard, I hoard PDFs on a Google Drive and tell people I know that game. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what I've been. That's what I've been doing since since the '90s. So, um, <laughs> bad respect. The. The other, the other one was um, was Cortex. Um, now I ha I haven't looked I haven't looked at Cortex <coughs> Prime, so take so take what I say about Cortex with a grain of salt. But my experience with Cortex is is <coughs> and specifically Cortex Plus is mainly from uh, Marvel Heroic, which I'm still salty about how that got shit canned, and um, Firefly. Yes, I haven't heard. 
Obi Wan voice. I haven't heard that name in a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I remember trying to dig into why it get, why it got um yeeted off of every off of every store like that, especially when it was especially when it won an Origins Award and was nominated for two Ennies. It was such a good system. It was like every good part of Fate and then more. <coughs> well, <coughs> um, Gazoon tight. Sorry. The yeah, no um. The okay. thing that the thing that I I covered it a long time ago, and the thing the thing that I um, pointed out was that it was the it was the first supers game that I'd that I'd played since Face Herp that seemed to uh, that seemed to try and address the disparity problem, or re- and or mm-hmm. the pro- or the problem that happens when you introduce advancement systems into superhero games because superheroes don't really level up; they side grade. Um, yeah, and by do by doing it in this br- in this broad die approach, where having a bigger die um, has its benefits and also has its drawbacks, as well as having yes, lower die I... have their have their benefit and dr- has their benefits and drawbacks, because yes, yes, the, yes. Um, with Cortex, the result isn't split. It's the it's the um, it's. You have two die that determine whether or not you succeed, and an effect die that determines how well you succeed. <coughs> yeah, um, I played. I played Marvel Heroic. I didn't mm-hmm. play Cortex. I, I always wanted to play Cortex. Um, I, I, I'm interested to see that you uh, think that you, you see similarities in the two. Um, I can definitely see that in like the core mechanics. I think when you get into like our combat, our combat's much more tactical and lethal than. Oh. Oh, definitely. The very like... story-driven aspect of mm-hmm. like uh, Cortex, which is like, I remember I in, at least in Marvel Heroic, I ran a character that uh, was from my edgy teenage years. So I won't go into too much, but <laughs> um, like, I, it was funny to me as a terrible sixteen-year-old. Um, uh, but I was playing um, a sniper, and like, I had a very very good time with that system, and I kind of regret that I have not gotten to play it again. <laughs> yeah, um, the reason I bring the reason I bring up um, Tenra is mainly mm-hmm. be, is mainly the die is mainly the die system that is used. Now, mm-hmm. Tenra's is success based, and it, it and it is an aim high and it is um it, it but it is an aim low approach. Mm-hmm. Instead instead of do, what ends up happening is. You don't roll attribute plus skill like you would traditionally. You just roll a number of die equal to your attribute. Your skill determines the number that you've got to roll under. In that in that particular setup. So if you're rolling five dice and you've got a you've got let's let's say um let's say weapon skill at three, you need to roll three mm-hmm. any roll any die that are three or less are going to be counted as successes. Yeah. Uh, again, these are, are interesting. these aren't one, these aren't one to one comparisons, ob- obviously, but it's in that it's in that sense of you of using the die system in some ways that are go- that are going to be a little bit unconventional. Yes, no, I, I totally get that. Um, I, I've seen some pretty and, and uh, the good dice systems we've seen are what like inspired us to want to break free of that d20 mold and we have a d20 in our game as a utility die that's the only time where it's like it doesn't really matter about well no it's, it's still like a roll low is better roll high is worse you know roll a 20 and tear a hole in reality mm-hmm. um that's a fun effect that, that i haven't got to use that one yet never divide by zero kids um but yeah uh Trying to think. Is that what I smell burning? <laughs> Sorry. Um. Go ahead. I. It's it's in my contract to get to get to give everybody a hard time. That is my version of equality. No, no, we're <laughs> fine. We're fine. Um, um, I am just thinking about like yeah, the dice. Uh, one of the things we tend to say with our dice system is the way we would describe it to anyone we were giving the pitch to is kindergarten teacher and a 
college professor are both teachers with the teaching skill, but one would reflect a better attribute and one, ref one would reflect training and they would be useless in each other's shoes. So it's like, it's creating that environment where like, no one player is always the best. And the reason we do that is because there's this thing where, like, in, there's this phenomenon in D&D, which I'm, I'm sure you've experienced that you know about. And, like, it, it, it's, not, it's not just D&D. It's any tabletop RPG that where there's no reason for the person with the best stat to not roll. Um, mm -hmm. is There's this environment where it's like, okay, well, it's a social encounter. Everyone who's not the social character whips out their phone. Um, um, it's a combat encounter. The wizard whips out their phone. <laughs> um, so it's, actually, uh, we we tried more directly with this system to keep people more engaged, and our playtest results have suggested we've done that. Um, well, if I if I want to be a smart ass, I could I could say that what that in a high level campaign, what happens for um, combat with D and D, what happens is the wizard casts a meteor swarm, and everybody else whips out their phones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like. The the point is that it, it's an island structure of gaming where like it, one person is kind of the focus at a time, and like that's fine sometimes. You want that sometimes, but mm -hmm. a lot of the time it can encourage a very disjointed feeling of, especially in combat. Uh, and our combat systems, uh, another beast. We don't really do initiative uh, in a traditional sense. We do like counters in a bag that we shuffle. Um, and that's done a lot for creating a more engaged combat scenario yeah. because players then when they draw a token get to choose who goes and they have to like talk about their plans a little bit. Yeah. Um so and when it when it comes to you know, when it, the thing the funny thing about that is um in my experience, a, a bad habit that a lot that a lot of a lot of players have whenever I whenever I um whenever I help run games at my LGS or um occasionally bully the newcomers for making really bad decisions, especially when I'm running Infinity, um <laughs> is that is um when when say a social encounter will go and they'll debate about they'll um start discussing about who about who's got the high who's got the highest skill in in a certain thing in a certain thing and um i let that i let that go for a little bit but af but afterwards i um as a, uh, now some pe now some people have argued that this was a form of intimidation but i came i came in one day and i've done this ever since and i brought in one of those clocks you you, you see in speed chess mm -hmm. <laughs> just just to, just to say <laughs> Just, just to say, you're not. I'm not giving you the option to, to, um, j to just, t to just talk about about, about who's going to take point on on this. You got to decide that now. <laughs> Which yeah, no, I, I, I get that. And like, sure, but like game mastering, like a, a good game master, a dungeon master can get around mm -hmm. any deficiency in the rules. Yeah. Um, our goal is to just make rules that don't need to be worked around. Um. I so, I get the feeling your yeah. your approach is more of when it comes to game mastering it should that um the proper amount of game the proper amount should be akin to a spice where you only need you only need a little you only need a little bit of change on onto it you don't need to drown your whole drown your whole plate in in nothing but paprika or something yeah I mean like I I want there to be the option for the per, for the casual like group that doesn't have time to do anything but pick up a module and play. I want them to be able to enjoy the game just as much as someone who wants to gut the system and, like, you know, throw out the world entirely and do their own thing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's always the balancing goal, and that's... Thankfully, we have multiple people involved in the project, so we can kind of get away with that. Uh, and in fact, we're actually... Long-term, we want to work towards uh, a generic system of Arrow Silence. Called, uh, we're calling it the Thorn system. Uh, Shrike, Thorn. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we're going for. Um, so that will be like the rules of Era of Silence without the setting. And maybe a less restrictive magic system because that's something that is only there because of my writing. 
Um, <laughs> sorry, I, I was just working on those notes before. Uh, we, I was just working on those notes before uh, we we got on this call. Yeah. I was working on what would we change for a generic system. I was like, oh, well, the magic system got to go. <laughs> yeah, that's that's. I don't. I honestly. Uh... I'd honestly argue that that um when it comes to a magic when it comes to a magic system and going gen, going generic um mm-hmm. having having different <coughs> having different magic traditions might might be might might be a a wise move but um I'm th- but I may be thinking too much of the spheres of power setup um yeah I mean like we're so I don't know if you really did you get to our magic system in our book um. I was able. Um, I was able to get. I was able to get into. I was able to get into some and, uh, but, un- what ended up. Ha- what ended up happening was a case of really bad luck. Because right as, because as I was reading through the thing, a storm's going on, and my power gets zapped mm-hmm. for about a second, which just killed. Which just killed my mood. No, you're totally fine. Mm-hmm. I get that. Um, so the magic system as we have it right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we like it because we feel like we've broken free of Vancean magic, at least in offensive magic, with a build your own spell system. We haven't gotten free of that in utility spells because at some point, you're just with a utility spell, you, you by necessity are describing the effect mm-hmm. and saying it's a discrete effect. So, um, but with our offensive magic, it's like a completely like build your own spell in the moment system with like an action. You know, utilizing the action economy of combat, which I won't explain here. All of this stuff is like totally available online, by the way, mm-hmm. to our, uh, our our friendly listeners. Um, you can find this stuff in the link I gave uh, Mildra. Um, and I I will but, be putting that in, I will be putting that in the low bar. Yeah, yeah sorry if the let me uh, let me see if I can plug anything else here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm, I'm fucking with you. <laughs> if if you. Pl- if you end up start pl- if you end up starting to plug Raid Shadow Legends, then this call is over. <laughs> I would love if anyone would pay me to say anything, uh, but no, we're not there yet. We have like two Patreon. We have we have two patrons on Patreon, which like yeah. we're so grateful for them. Mm-hmm. But one of them is Dan's mom. Yeah. Um, so it's like now um, one one thing that I did one thing that I did find interesting because I always am, I always am a sucker for this kind of thing is. Mm-hmm. Instead of do, it would I could easily see it being very tempting to do a straight up um, race class dynamic with with this with this approach, um, you know, it's called keeping in footsteps of the 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 so called world's greatest role playing game. Jeez, I can feel myself cringe whenever I have to say yeah. that. But instead, when it comes to the class part of it, you've got it split between training and focus. Yes, no, you, you picked up exactly what we're going for. So, um, we do like a spe- so like you pick your species, race, we we debated that term back and forth because we're both social science nerds. Um but uh so we yeah, so you pick your species, then you pick um a training, which is like an overarching like set of skills and you get special traits which I would consider Akin to D and D feats or Savage World, Savage World's edges, mm-hmm. things that make your character better in gameplay, in specific circumstances. Um, the concept exists everywhere, but traits you get them all throughout character creation. But you basically can like mix and match these character creation options to make anything you want. Uh, so we'll have people who like make like a standard like I am a underworld assassin, underworld hunter. I think is the term we use in Era of Silence. Mm-hmm. Um, underworld hunter and i have a corporate background and i am a close combat specialist that's cool all of those things work together that's a very like generic rogue build but you can also do like i am a magically trained engineer with a exoskeleton yeah uh so this powered exoskeleton and this uh ability to cast spells and then also like throwing in like you know that person could be a tactician and like the combat role is like completely divorced from classes, uh, so that no one's ever useless in combat. Um, their skills are like so. Training and focus determine like your skills outside of combat, and some of your gear, and then your 
in combat stats are like entirely determined by other choices so you don't have to choose between being relevant in combat and relevant outside of combat yeah um i will admit that the the four trainings that are just that are described in here for for whatever reason it reminded me of the um of the um, writings that I saw, that I saw about power, that I saw about power sources when fourth edition was being developed. Because, because. Um, go ahead. Now, not in not in a not in a crunch sense, but more in a more in a thematic sense. Because unlike some unlike some previous and some and some concur and some of the editions that would follow, um, fourth had that emphasis on. Okay, this okay, you have the, you have these different types of power sources. You've got martial, you've got arcane, you've got divine, eventually and eventually you'd have primal and psionic. Um Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's that's something I see that's something I have to I have to wonder if that was a um minor influence in that regard, especially considering the potential combinations that you can have with training and focus. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so our creative our creative process. I'm sure these like these games that we played growing mm -hmm. up on. Like, I'm sure they were influential. It wasn't like a conscious thing. Our process initially was we had like a. Initially, every character creation option was only going to have four steps, like only four options. Mm -hmm. We we we've we've backed off on that sense because like we had to, we had to add, add like a fifth species to like give every option for like a, for a stat boosts. Um. Then we uh, we had to break up training and focuses because it was unclear before that people didn't have to pick a training that like didn't have to pick a focus that matched their training. Uh, so people kept like hyper specializing when they could have done anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to encourage people to do anything else. We want to encourage those really cool diverse characters. Um, but no, so uh, going back to your point, the um, the influence of fourth edition, I think in the sense that like yeah, that's. That was how we were trained to think about games because that was our first, our first time playing. And like, I mean, Dan and I both have been playing together, so it's it's been cool that we've we've did, been doing this for twelve years and like have that shared frame of reference. So like, we don't have trouble getting what we want out of our mechanics from like while talking to each other. Of course, something I do appreciate when it comes to when it comes to skill use is the fact that one of my one of my biggest biggest pet peeves, the real big burr up my ass, has always been knowledge being treated as a skill. Yes, I know where you're going with this because more often than not, that ends up leading to skill bloat. Um. Yeah, I I don't like that. I, I don't like people not knowing things because everyone knows things. Everyone knows something. Mm -hmm. It just might not be the same thing. Yeah. Now, so some, we go ahead. Sorry. Some ga some games have gotten some games have tried to have tried to work around, but um, a lot, but a lot of time, I think the, I think the. The big, the big, the big offenders when it comes to the whole, the whole knowledge as a skill thing for me are always going to be um, Pathfinder and even though I love it to death, Shadowrun. Yeah, both games I've played. <laughs> I, I was, a, I was a gunslinger in Pathfinder for a long time. Great mm -hmm. times. <laughs> but hello. But, oh. And while, and while there's, and the um. The trivia thing that I see that I see that you have that you have here, um, in a way, does remind me of how Fantasy Craft handled its take on knowledge, where you had a bunch of um, different subjects that <coughs> alt that, when combined together, ultimately made your quote unquote knowledge check. Yeah, like so. What we do with Era of Silence and knowledge is so we have two kinds of knowledge. We have knowledge and we have trivia. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is like. If you have repair three, so that's three dice in repair, which is like halfway to like max in repair, you're pretty talented. You know as much as a person with three levels of uh, training in repair would. Um, but also, there's a lot of things that don't really get covered in like skill knowledges. And so, yeah, like you said, either you, you, you face this dilemma where it's either make a knowledge skill, 
which feels weird because then it implies that implies that everyone who doesn't have that skill is like inherently dumber. And I really like we 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 in our sense really want to move away from these ideas and like um. So. Trivia was like a way to like encompass like yeah we every person knows something. So, like, maybe your character knows us more about pop culture and food than, like, the military. But, like, you can know, or you can know all of those. Um, you can uh, keep accumulating them. Uh, and those give you helpful hints throughout the little adventure. Like, when I'm writing modules, I write, like, this character with this trivia would know this. Or this character with this knowledge would know this. Um, keeping, and also then, like, the, the harder checks there for, like, you have to, you almost have to have those kinds of things with the pre-existing setting, because if not, no one's ever going to understand what the world they're in. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have like knowledge skills that like are easily easy to use and like fun to use, because if not, people just won't care about the setting they're in, and I want them to care about the world I've written. Yeah. Now, the other. Th Going going back to the, to what I'm to what was I was that mentioned. like a whole tangent? <laughs> um, I consider Hello? I consider my podcast to be a to be a series of tangent to be a series of tangents. Hello? Oh, okay. I sorry, I was worried I lost you there for a second. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I, the other the other thing that I, the other thing when it comes to that whole, when it comes to the um, the fourth edition. Hello. Station. Okay. Hang on. Apologies for the silence for for a moment. The yes. hello. All right, all right then. That's all. That's What's all the last that. thing you heard? Um, last last thing I heard was you saying that you couldn't hear me. But um, when it comes, the other thing that I did that I um, I think I think provides a nice little. A nice little trinity and kind and kind of kind of touches on a theme when it comes to character creation. And this is that each of the each, each of the choices, it's a package, but you're not necessarily restrained to that package, which is which is why I've been hesitating to call anything an equivalent to a class within um, Era of Silence. If you're talking, but, I can't hear you. I'm so sorry. Hang on. Um what I was say what I was saying is that I see I see a nice I see a nice trinity of packages within character creation which seem which to me seems to be a, seems to be a case where you didn't would it be fair to say you didn't want to have it that the decisions that you make early on be the deciding factor of where you're going to go I lost for you again I'm so sorry For the for the rest of the for the uh, rest of the character's career, um, like, can I, I lost in the middle of that? Can mm -hmm. you short, say that quickly, just one more time? It's in, would it be fair to say that one of the design goals you had with the combination of of um. Of com of combat specialty focus and training, be a, because it's package based. Would you would was one of your goals to make it so that um, I'm the, so sorry. Like every single time you get into the middle of this sentence, you <laughs> like cut out for twenty seconds. Yeah. D Hang on. This okay, I should I should be back now. I. Don't I don't know what I don't know what that was about. <laughs> no, it's totally okay. Um, we're we're back uh, as long as we're good. <laughs> yeah. What I was saying, what I was, what I was trying to get get at is that 
was one of your goal was one of your goals to make sure that your opening decisions don't play a deciding factor in the re in the rest of your character's progression, or uh, not to say that yeah, they don't, like, not to say that they play no factor, but that they aren't um, they aren't the deciding factor. Yeah, like you aren't bound. Like if you make a thiefy build, you don't have to. You could with augmentations and gear and uh, regular character advancement make a character that's more tanky with time. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, so a character that's both dexterous and tanky or something. Um, you can definitely do that. Um, and, like, we want to encourage you to do those different things. We're actually, in the next release, we're hoping to have a list of, like, traits you can take on as uh, leveling bonuses. Like, uh, like stuff that makes you better at dual wielding, or stuff that makes you better at fist fighting. Um, stuff that makes you able to cast spells if you weren't able to at character creation. Um, but, like, you don't have the same benefits as someone who, like, took the... But also, like, then the challenge is not making character creation useless. And so then, like, keeping those benefits in character creation that, like, the people who take character creation magic are always going to be better at it than people who don't. Because they have an inherent mental resistance to frying their cell frying themselves. Because I like magic systems where the mage can fry themselves. Well you did you did say you liked Dark Heresy, so so there you yes. go. <laughs> that was one of my favorite NPCs that was one of my favorite player character deaths was one of them turned into a demon. I told him. I kept telling him, you keep rolling skills like that, you're gonna turn into a demon. <laughs> Um, he turned into a demon, and he's dead now. I it's didn't. Not, I didn't have the person's fine. I didn't have the. I didn't have the demon host problem. I did have. I did have a problem. Um. With... I. I. I miss Dark Heresy, but I don't think it, Dark Heresy is one of those games where it's like I love it, but I can't bring myself to run it because I have to explain this universe where the satirical aspect of the fascist state doesn't always come through. Uh, and so... Um, yeah. I did... I did... I did have a similar instance, but with Warhammer Fantasy. Go ahead. Um, because I kept... I kept telling one of my... I kept telling one of my... Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I kept telling one of my players to e to ease up on on throwing on throwing fire every throwing fire everywhere, otherwise they were going to explode. Um, and they end up rolling bad. Then they end up rolling badly, and um, I lost you again for another oh, twenty seconds. Damn, dang it. Um, I had a um, I had a fire wizard in a um, Warhammer Fantasy campaign who. Was a little bit too liberal with his with his use of fire. He was a borderline pyromaniac, and I kept warning him, "You keep that up, and you're gonna blow up." And he was like, "Hey, hey, hey! I'm a fire mage. Blowing up things is what I do." And um, Hello? he did he he didn't listen. Hang hang on. this hello all right all right now i'm back now i'm back sorry about sorry about that but um eventually karma ended up biting said fire wizard and he um exploded left a very fine paste but Hang it. Hang Hello. On. I can hear you. Okay. Um. Now, when it when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the setting. Um, since I get I get the feel based on how you had described it, it's it sounds like you had written the setting first and then. I'm so sorry. Like every second sentence, you cut off. It's the what I was getting at is that it's it's 
it seems from where I'm from where I'm sitting that you ended up writing the set the setting the uh, world of Vion um, before you started applying mechanics to it. Is that would that be correct? Hello. Hello. Um, what I was say, what I was saying is is that um, because I want I wanted to ask a few things on the on the campaign setting itself. Yes, of course. Now, when it come now, would it be f first? Would it be fair of me to say that you wrote the you wrote the narrative of the campaign setting first before you started applying any mechanics? Um. Yeah. The narr like there's like a main arc which like is like going to turn into a series of campaign books, mm -hmm. a la Curse of Strahd, that sort of thing. Um, Rise of the Rune Lords. I, I only know D and D D twenty based campaign books, but um, um, uh, I know there's yeah. others. Um, well, what? Well, two bi two big ones. I, I could, two big um, ones I could bring up are um, seat or stuff like. Are you with me? Yeah, I'm with you. Are things like Sieges, Tolkien, and um, the Enemy Within. In fact, the Enemy Within is a lengthy one. Like that's like ten. That's going to be like ten books for its fourth edition version. And hang on. You with me? Yep. <coughs> yeah, it shows me when you're back. Um, okay. Uh, so I, um, yeah, I, I, a lot of it's older than the world. Like I, like I was saying in before, these stories were like going to be their own thing and they were going to be their own like setting guide a couple times, mm -hmm. but they've kind of, the world has changed with the game in some ways. And then in some ways the, you know, the, the, the game changed for the world, um, so, like, definitely, like, the magic system reflects the world a bit, but also, like, I, um, the world got a little bit more interesting when, like, we added grenade effects the way we did. Because those are a very common, um, weapon we see used. Things like resin grenades, things like that, and then, like, the, the feel it gives to a setting when, like, you have, like, weaponry like that. Mm-hmm. Now, do you can now when it, I've seen I was when I was going through the setting I was jumping back and forth about especially especially because of the cover art whether whether or not mm -hmm. this was whether or not this would count as diesel punk. Um, do you see it as that or do you see it as whether or not this would count as what as diesel punk? Do you see it as that or do you see it as something else entirely? Hello. I'm here. Okay. Do you can, as I was saying, as I was saying before, the ping gods decided to screw me. Do you can what's? Do you can do you consider that there might be some elements of era to have to have a bit of diesel punk elements, or was that not, or was that not within um, the line of thinking when you were developing? We use the term biopunk or chemipunk uh, because, like, when you go into like the technology, it's all alchemy based. So it's it's much more future. It's like it's so Shadowrun is a futuristic fantasy setting where it was our world that got fantasified. Mm -hmm. That's a word now. <laughs> um, and our world got weird fantasy shit. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a fantasy world that aged on its own and, like, asking questions of, like, what's this future look like? 
um, for these people who had like things like health potions that could like solve every injury. Um, so like you'll see a lot of like chemical augmentation. Like we're actually about to add like a lot of art to the book of like uh, different augments you can get and like the kind of looks that those like um, encourage. Um, all of our artwork, except for the cover of the narrator's guide and the map Bayern. and the Shrike logo, have been done by Moss, uh, a fantastic artist who I am so happy to know. Oh. So, like, they are they they in a lot of ways are responsible for the aesthetics of Vian. <laughs> Yeah, I can definitely get I can definitely get that. Um, now, when you meant now when you mention um, when you meant when you mention um al when you mention alchemy, um, is it how is it a case where al where alchemy is a uh, where is the most is the more prevalent um, application of science within the setting? Yeah, it, 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 I, I call it "quote unquote" scientific alchemy. Like, there's like a field. There's a there's there's like a scientific consensus. Mm -hmm. uh, it, most science is done through the lens of alchemy, or like that kind of like arcane manipulation of the world. Um, and like, th there's a lot of like physics I could go into, but I don't think I, I don't have my charts. <laughs> no, I. If I, well, if I need if I need to fill a chart if I need to fill a chart potion, I could always break out my copy of Rollmaster. Uh, what's I I heard I heard Rollmaster. <laughs> I'm saying if I needed if if we needed to fill a chart quotient for the, for the show, we could o I could always break out my copy of Rollmaster. Uh, or. I.e. Middle Earth role play a game a game where about twenty percent of the book was nothing but charts. And hang on a second. Hello? Give, give me a sec give me a second trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Okay, and we're and we are back. Um, okay, hello. <laughs> so, yeah, I was uh, apparent. I guess the I guess the technology guys don't like me making chart jokes. Um, um, yeah. So that's Moss has done a lot with the setting. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of the writing for it, and like the world of Vian. Uh, B I A N mm -hmm. is um, that's mostly my doing, but together we've created like a very. A lot of it's on like our page and stuff like that. Um, here, I'll. Hopefully, this doesn't like murder your connection because I, I can send you some of the art. <laughs> um, yeah, go. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Did. <laughs> It'll, it'll that's some of the uh, augmentation mm -hmm. art Moss mm -hmm. has been doing for us recently in your in uh, Discord inbox. All right. Uh, I apologize to the listeners in the audio medium. Yeah, it's it's one of the it's borderline one of those cases of breaking a of breaking a um, primary rule of te rule of television. But um, well, but we'll just run it. Do the ping gods not like it when I send large files <laughs> to you while you're on a call? <laughs> did I just did I just kill the call again? I'm so sorry. Um
Oh, there it is. Now. Nice. I see that the eyes have it. I see that the eyes ha I see that the eyes have it and uh, and apparent and <laughs> yeah, Hey I um I, okay I can hear you. Mm -hmm. What's up? I see that the I see that the eyes have it and there's a bunch of other eye jokes that I that I could that I could make on that matter. Um Now something I'm something I'm curious ab about <coughs> is you have a you have a system that de that um, definitely has a whole lot of science when it comes to alchemy. Something that I'm always curious about when it com when it comes to technological um, influenced fantasy settings. I won't say I won't say base because I'm not sure that applies here. Yeah, but... it's not like we're there, there was there was not a lot of science involved in the writing room. No. Um... I don't mean any offense when I say this, but you do not strike me as somebody who would who would go full on hard science with their work. No, it's not my <laughs> interest. Um, uh, in fact, I've in fact, well, to be to be fair, not many people would because because I have a hard time finding hard science RPGs. Period. I think I've only got like eight. <laughs> Supposedly, I'm playing in one tomorrow called Cipher. But cipher. Wait the wait the cipher system has hard science unless I'm unless I'm thinking no, of something. No, uh, hard no hard cipher is not cipher is not hard science. The setting I'm in is supposed to be hard science. Ah, um, that's that I, I'm supposed to be playing in one tomorrow. Yeah, in the cipher system yeah. that is a hard science game. Yeah. Now the now um, but what I'm always curious about is. Is the interaction between ma between magic and tech in the, in this regard, and this is kind of touched upon with the concept of alchemy, but I'm curious where that relationship um, is affected when it comes to tr when it comes to traditional spell ca spell casting I, magic. I mean, so I guess, do you mind if I give the whole spiel of like the story as like why things are the way they are? Go ahead. Um. Like you, you were the one, you've There's been... settings. Okay. I've seen that in other I've seen that in other settings before, mm -hmm. but I wanted to like start with that as like a beginning concept mm -hmm. and like build a world around that. Um, so over time, it became more and more important. And like the reason, like this world is slowly decaying, and like the forces of magic are getting weaker, and they're relying more on science and like their own creations, their own power to like overcome this world that's kind of decaying without their gods. Hence, hence the name era of magic science. is divine magic. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, so, hence the name era of silence. Mm -hmm. Um, and all magic is uh, divine magic and the divine magic is waning because the gods are gone. Uh, their powers are getting weaker, so mages often augment themselves with alchemy to like make themselves better. Uh, they'll take potions and drugs to like get better, um, and then like they'll also like you know more people use alchemy than they might. People are more likely to pop a health potion than they are to like cast a healing spell because a health potion is much more likely to succeed with the right training. Um, so. And I'm now when it comes now um you've meant you've when it comes to when it comes to the uses of, of those of those kind of augmentations um mm -hmm. in the past, in other games when I've seen augmentations get used there's always um some some sort of catch like 
Since I used the Shadowrun example earlier, I'll bring that up again. In that one, using Cyberware or, Bi or Bioware, no, not that one, will um, we'll reduce, we'll reduce your total essence. And for mages, yeah. of course, they need that. And reducing that to zero basically makes you a cyber zombie. Um, yes, I, 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 I'm actually a big fan of a lot of cyberpunk games. I would consider that my favorite quote unquote genre. Um, so, yeah, I'm familiar with the mechanic you're talking about, the, yeah. the humanity mechanic. It, although that's the problematic term for it. <laughs> well, <coughs> well te technically, ev technically, every. Every type, every character type that that one can have in Shadowrun are um, humans. It's, they're just yes. me, it's just metahuman types. Um, yeah, I, I I I don't like hidden world fantasy, which I I know that's not technically what Shadowrun is, but I I don't want to be on Earth. I don't know. <laughs> um, it, I, I'm so, this is me being entirely petty. There's nothing wrong with <laughs> Shadowrun at all, like as a system. <laughs> um. Well, except except for when except for when I get pelted by three pounds worth of six ciders, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what? But um, would it? But would there be a similar? Would there be a similar approach with somebody using too many augmentations in Era, where you where using, uh, oh, using too, too much augmentations or too much drugs can um, create a backlash? Drugs, yes. Um, content warning, overdose. Um, we do have like an overdose system, um, and like you know, so if you if you slam more than like a, one or two potions at a time, like you're probably going to like down yourself, um, just because that's potions are pretty powerful effects. Augments at the moment, we don't have any caps on them, but most of the effects, like most of the caps, are in the augments themselves, like only take a speed boost so many times you can only because it's we don't really want players to have to think about like it in game terms which i think that the to and to be honest with something like that if you if you i'd say if you've got somebody who's over augmenting there's prob there's probably gonna, mm -hmm. they're probably going to be looked at as as that um, as that as that as that weirdo or the or the guy who got a, who fell a little bit too deep in the rabbit hole. Yeah, and like, also like they're like their enemies are like very augmented people. Like you know, like they're kind of going against like like in my in my campaign, like my camp my players are somewhat opposed to like this like fascist government, and the, the like the 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 strong man at the head of it is like this like heavily augmented man who's like looks like he's in his 20s despite he's like 80 <laughs> um just that kind of like you know like that that kind of augmentation that like defies reality and mortality if you have enough money and like then playing with like class dynamics and like all art is political and i see my game as art i don't know <laughs> uh that's the whole thing um uh implications without the essence mechanic, I think is what I'm going for. Um, yeah. Me per me personally, my only my only issue with the with the essence mechanic is that it is when you consider when you consider the literal toy box that you've got that you've got for uh, cyberware, um it does put it does put a bit of a bottleneck. Uh, yes. On the on the thing because you're because un unless you're unless you're really really good at, at optimizing, which um, which if you're doing that, then you're basically you're basically the turbo nerd to end all turbo nerds. <laughs> yeah. You you're going you're going to ha you're going to have um. You're only gonna you're only gonna be able to, to do so much, and for me personally, my I will freely admit my introduction to Cyberpunk was um, Ghost in the Shell. So mm -hmm. the idea of the idea of doing somebody who's in a, who's in a full cybernetic body is not possible with Shadowrun. 
Yeah. Um, my, my introduction to Cyberpunk, besides, like, the Gibson novels, um, was Cyberpunk 2020. Um, well, actually, my, my introduction to Cyberpunk was a guy who did YouTube videos. Do you remember Counter Monkey? Unfortunately, uh, most, mostly because the, the, guy in que- the guy in question, I have... Um, it's a long story. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't don't be. I I ended up getting the last laugh in the end. No, I I I, I understand that he's he's supposed to be like a contentious figure. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, he is, and I w- I was um I was I was a little closer to to some of those events than I than I'd like to admit. <laughs> but I I know who I know who you're talking about. Um. But. When it... And I played Cyberpunk mm-hmm. 2020. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. And and uh, and to bring and to bring things full circle on that, now we're now that's coming back in the form of Cyberpunk Red. Yeah, I'm very excited to see how that goes because Cyberpunk 2020 kind of sucked. <laughs> um, like honestly, um, when you like get into the meat of the system, like it, the, the second you start adding in those like those shopping books, which I had, I had the shopping books mm-hmm. because I was sold in the shopping books. They break the fucking game the second you have a power gamer. Um, on one on one hand, I can see that. On on the other hand, it's it's one of it's one of those things where it's it stuff like those shopping books was and that and that amount of excessive detail was pretty common in the '90s. So I see that more of a product of its time. Yeah, and like this is like I'm. But um, <coughs> sorry, but with... I'm branching into its own like cyberpunk setting <laughs> that I did. Yeah, like I, I I made like a cyberpunk setting out of like a Savage World thing uh, called uh, the Traverse. Mm-hmm. Um, I should introduce you to Christian Nome one of these days. You'd get you'd get along with him. Um, <laughs> but with with that said, what do you? S- now I realize that Era of Silence is in is in a is um in a sta- is in a state of consistent develop um I'll say semi consistent oh yeah yeah because yeah. it's not because it's not um, it's not like you're it's not like you're in full crunch mode twenty um twenty four seven with it but <coughs> no what... we're in um we're in what we call open play tests um mm-hmm. you know we're but what. What do you see as f- as what do you see as some of the um, future developments for um, for Era of Silence? Like what what's the what okay. are the things you're refining on currently? Yes. Um... When we have point five out, we think that's going to be a pretty solid build um, to let anyone start the game with. Mm-hmm. And that's just going to be improvements from there. Um, we also have a narrator's guide, which is like our version of a game master, just our our game theory. We think it's the better term for what our person should be. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to hopefully have that by the end of the end of the year. Um, I'm hoping for a beginner friendly module uh, by. October 11th, which is the one-year anniversary of our, um... Um... So, hopefully we'll have this module out then that anyone can pick up and play. It'll be a little bit Halloween-oriented, so it'll be a good time to, like, you know, play it with your friends. Um... And you'll get a feel for the game and see if you like it. Um... Then we're also hoping to... So, like, at some point, Dan's going to take the Thorn system and, like, do some other stuff with it, while I focus on, like, campaign books within Era of Silence and, like, 
more content to just fill out the, that game. Um, while we both also kind of like trade off on like the generic system and figuring out what else we can do with these rules. All right, now I'll, d I'll definitely be looking forward to that. Um, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for braving the hell that is time zones and co to come up to the temple. And I've had such a lovely time. Thank you. Thank, thank you for thank you for putting up with my um te with my um technical problems and the fact that the gods of technology apparently apparently do have decided I have not paid enough penance. <laughs> um, I'm so sorry. I hope that uh, hopefully. No, I'll, I'll just I'll just yell at a few people. That usually solves the problem. People tend people tend to people tend to listen when they when they have to look up at the person talking to them. So there's my tall guy joke for the day. Um, and I'll get you anything else you need. But mm -hmm. I oh um to the people uh, thanks so much for listening. Um, please uh, check us out. Uh, there's a link that I'll give Mildred, but also uh, we're Strike Tabletop. That's Strike like the bird. And then tabletop, like the word tabletop, um, on everything. That's where you can find us. And you'll usually find me, because I wear a lot of hats in this company. So yeah, thanks so much for having me. I, my pleasure. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, um, the door is always open. And as, as I always say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Hell yeah. Um, I'm having a... I mean, it's not like I'm doing much, so I'll, I'll be in touch. <laughs> All right. And, and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.